many people uh, wrongly believe that being saved is the same thing as being a Christian. Uh, you know, before I really came to this church, before I found Bible-believing truth, I didn't really understand the difference that, that uh, you know, some people might say that they're a Christian, but really they just mean that they're saved and they don't really know what being a Christian is. Salvation is not the same thing as fellowship. You can be saved on your way to heaven with a mansion waiting for you when you get up there, but it doesn't mean that you're walking with God. It doesn't mean that you actually have fellowship with Him. Walking with God is fellowship. And because people confuse the two, they often end up doubting their salvation and thinking that when they're not walking with God, when they're sinning, when they're backsliding, that they're not saved. And it's because of a lot of false doctrine that creeps into churches, Calvinism or, or lordship salvation. If the Lord's not Lord over all, then he's not the Lord at all and all kinds of garbage like that. And the truth is you can be saved, but you might not have fellowship with God. And so don't, don't confuse the two and don't let people uh, try to talk you out of your salvation. If you're saved, you're saved. And, and nothing can change that fact. Your walk with God doesn't affect the fact that you are saved. Amen. But everything that you do in your life, your walk will affect right. your walk. Right. Amen? Um, and, and it affects everything now until you meet the Savior. So perhaps you've been struggling with this concept. Perhaps you've been struggling with sin and, and it's been confusing. Well, hopefully you get some clarity now. So, so uh, maybe you've been, you've been struggling in sin. You've been living out in the world. Turn to God and say, you know what, God, I ruined my life and I tried to go the wrong way. Things didn't work out, but now I want to turn to you. I want to walk close to you and, and I want to be a Christian. Don't just be saved. Be a Christian, right? Um, uh, it doesn't really matter uh, how many sins you have or, or it doesn't matter whether or not you go to church. The fact is that you can go to church, you can tithe, you can soul win, but doing those things doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is, is your heart towards God and, and along with those things. You can, you can come to church, but your heart be way out in the world. You can tithe and even try to soul win, but your heart's not in it. And you know what? You won't be any closer to the Lord. Um, so are you just going to church to check off boxes to say, yeah, I went, I tithe, I did soul winning, I did those things that make me a Christian, I did those things to look like I'm part of them. But God cares about your heart and at the judgment seat of Christ, your works are tried in the fire of what sort it is. It doesn't matter what you do, it's what sort it is. So where's your heart? Um, I'm guilty of doing a lot of things with my heart not right. And guess what? The Lord said it's meaningless. I'm not getting anything for that. Wood, hay, stubble, right? Um, coming to church and tithing, they're easy ways to seem spiritual to people. You may be here you may be tithing, you may be doing the things about, of, of a Christian, but your heart's not in it, and you may trick everyone here. It's real easy to trick people. It's real easy to act spiritual and seem spiritual to people. But you know who's not tricked? It's God. God has a scope, and it's lasered in on every single one of our hearts. And he says, I see that you're not here. You're physically here, but your heart could be everywhere else. Um, and, and so he wants your heart. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't want your time. He doesn't want the image of being a great spiritual person. He wants that heart. And so uh, if your heart is not right with God, then you got a big problem. If all you did was keep your heart soft towards God, towards his word and the preaching of his word, amazing things would happen. And amazing things would happen in your life and the life of everybody around you. Um, Unfortunately, oftentimes, especially in these last days, what ends up happening is just like sheep, we wander away from church. We wander away from God, from the people of God, from the hymns, from the preaching of his word and from the Lord who died for us. We get off in the world and, and, and we get all confused and we get hurt and we wonder what's going on. But it's because the Lord is supposed to be our shepherd. And if he's not our shepherd, if we if we wander away, well, what's protecting us? We're on our own. So my friend, have you been wandering lately? Have you been going to and fro without any direction? I pray this sermon will help you. The title of my sermon is Which Way Sheep? Which Way Sheep? Let me pray real quick. Uh, Father God, I just uh, come before you, Lord, and I ask that you uh, pull me aside, Lord, and just put your word 
uh, in front of these people, Lord. Put your word in front of everyone so that they can see from your word and that they uh, may learn, Lord, and, and get whatever they need to get right with you, God. And I just pray, Lord, that um, it not be me and that you fill me up so that uh, these people get something, Lord. And I thank you for your word and I thank you for what you've done for us. I just pray, Lord, that you would um, meet us here today and be, be in this sermon. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. So, so my first point is don't stop fellowship. Don't stop fellowship. Go ahead and turn over to uh, 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, uh, and we'll read verse 4 through 10. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in light, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, uh, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If you are saved in Jesus Christ, that means you belong to God, right? God said, or John said that God is light here. So if God is light, isn't it fair to say that we should try to do everything we can to make that light shine in us and through us? Shouldn't we try to make ourselves align with the word of God and, and who God is, which is light and no darkness at all? Um, don't you, aren't you tired of living in the darkness of sin? Darkness of sin that's weighing you down? Don't you want to look back on your life and go, wow, look at all this light that I showed to everyone around me. Look at all this light that, that just beamed out of my life. And it's because of the book and it's because of God. The only way that you can have the right kind of fellowship with the Lord is by walking in the light. The Bible says in Psalms 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That word of God is a light. Every time you get in that book, it's, it's getting you to take a step in the right direction. Every time you're, you're coming to the Lord and you're asking him to show you something, you're walking in the light and you're taking steps in the right direction. So, so will you do that today? Uh, God is giving you his perfect word to be your light, guiding you. And, and it's guiding you in the way that you should walk. Some people think that, oh, there's a deeper answer that you must find to understand how to be a Christian. That there's some tips or tricks that you need to learn to make being a Christian easier. Being a Christian is real simple. Read the Bible, pray, and come to church. That, what, what more, what deeper answer is there? That's, that's as deep of an answer as you need, and that's, that's it. It's real simple, right? But a lot of people think that, oh, you know what? I need, to, I need to be filled with the Spirit and speak in tongues, or I need, to, I need to move to a mountain to be closer to God, or I need to learn original Greek and Hebrew, or I need all these, all these gadgets, and, and uh, you know what? Uh, uh, the mark of the beast, I don't know. I mean, uh, but, but those answers, none of those tips and tricks will help you. You have to come to the reality and knowledge that, you know what? It's only those three things. And it's those three things combined. You know, if you're praying and you're not reading your word, it's not going to be very helpful. If you're reading your word without praying, you're not going to get as much understanding as if you did those things. And uh, your fellowship with God will be broken. Above everything, Dr. Ruckman said, the most important thing is your spiritual relationship between you and your creator. If that is right, everything else will get right. Nothing is settled till it is settled with God. Fellowship is when you and the Lord have no unsettled issue between you and no point of contention or controversy. So maybe the reason why your relationships in your life are a mess is because your relationship with God is a mess. Maybe if you get that right, those relationships will fall into place. Either you recognize and confess your sins, getting right with God down here, or as first, uh, like 1 John 1, 9 says, right, you confess your sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, or you, or you wait and face the judgment seat of Christ, 
which is the terror of the Lord. Why would you want to wait to get things right up there when he tells you to get it right down here so you don't have to worry about it? Just get it right so you don't have to worry about it. And that's also something that I didn't really, I had no clue about the judgment seat of Christ when, when I was going to, to churches before and reading the NIV and all that garbage. I had no idea that there was a judgment seat of Christ waiting for Christians, for saved people, but there is. And, and there's going to be a lot of sad Christians on that day when they realize that, wow, there is a judgment and it's for me. And it's for everything I've done and it's based off of what sort I do. And there's going to be so many tears shed at the feet of Jesus. And so many people are going to be wondering, what did I waste my time on? I, I regret doing those things. Why didn't I just get right and why didn't I stay right? And, and why did I think it was so hard and why did I keep hurting the Lord? Yes. What was it all for? It's going to be all for nothing. My second point is don't stop Bible reading. Don't stop Bible reading. Uh, maybe you think that it's not really that important for you to read your Bible every day. Uh, maybe just, you know, six days a week or two days a week. One day a week is good enough. Sunday I come in, I hear the word, you know, I'm reading my Bible. But my friend, skipping just one day of Bible reading can be all the devil needs to devour you. Um, I've skipped many Bible reading days, all right? I'm not saying that I'm perfect, and I'm not saying that I got it down, and, and, and I never skip. I've skipped plenty of times. And, and it's scary to think that one of those times the devil could have easily devoured me. The devil could have easily just taken a hold of me and, and ruined me so, so deep and so uh, hurt that I wouldn't have even known where to begin to get back. And, and, um, you, and it's only by God's grace that I haven't been devoured yet. It's only by God's grace that I'm still standing and walking and able to, to read the word and to try to get something out of it. And you might say, oh, Brother Daniel, I don't believe that just skipping one Bible reading day that, that God would let the devil hurt me. You know, um, I'm a child of God after all. My friend, you're so blind and so deceived by the devil, you have no idea how happy that roaring lion is. He's like, yeah, just keep thinking that. Just keep thinking that. Keep thinking that. I may not get you right now, but I'll get you eventually. Turn over to 1 Peter uh, uh, chapter 5. Just a few pages back. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Um... There's a lot of people who think that as long as you're not intoxicated, well, then you're being sober, you're following the verse. And it's true, if you're not intoxicated, you are sober. But you know what another meaning of sober is? It means to be serious. Christian, being a Christian is something serious. It's not, it's not a game that you can just play. It's not, a, it's not Monopoly where you can just, you know, you can just have some fun and, oh, you know what? It's, uh, I'm not saying that being a Christian is not fun. It is. But, but there's a lot of people who think that, that, you know what, it's all just fun and games. It doesn't matter what you do in this life. It doesn't matter how you're living your testimony because, you know what, you're saved. And they think that being saved is being a Christian. You see how, how that where they get the, the, the conflict from, where they get the confusion from. And, and um, the truth is, if you were face to face with a lion, you wouldn't play any games. If you were standing in front of a lion, a roaring lion, waiting in front of you, you would go, all right, this is, this is time to get serious. This is time to get serious. I, I'm not playing any games. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not messing around. I don't want to get eaten. And you might go, oh, uh, I, I would stand up and, and try to take that lion face on. My friend, if that lion starts roaring, there's not a single person on the face of the earth who wouldn't be terrified. Yeah. Are you kidding me? You think that you're going to take a lion head on? Boy, you're, you're deceived, my friend. Um, and yet you have Christians who think that the devil's a joke. Like the devil's somebody who you can just mess with. That, that he's a nobody. He's not a nobody. The devil, the Bible says, was, is full of wisdom. He's a wise being. He's a wise being. And the only way that you can victoriously contend with the devil 
is by following what the Bible says. I mean, what did Jesus do when he was, when he was being tempted by the devil? He said, it is written three times and quoted scripture. If anybody didn't need scripture, it was the Lord. If anybody didn't need to quote scripture, it was Jesus. Right? He was the word. He could have said anything. But what did he do? He said, no, I'm going to quote scripture. I'm going to remember scripture. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that as my weapon. I'm not going to use my own wisdom. I'm not going to use the wisdom of the world. I'm not going to use any other tips and tricks. I'm going to use the book. So you have to put on the whole armor of God, like Ephesians 6 says, so that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. If you try to fight the devil on your own without God and without his book, you're going to fall. You're going to fail. You're not going to be successful. Um, the devil's interested in devouring saved Christians. Do you think that Peter, when he wrote this, he wrote this for the lost world? Do you think he was writing this for, for people who are living in sin and, and weren't saved and, and weren't trying to live right? No, he wrote this for Christians. What, what, is, what, is, um, what does he say in, uh, in verse uh, 2? He says, feed the flock of God which is among you. He's talking to pastors. And so he's talking to pastors. He's talking about saved people here. So do you think Peter thought, well, the devil's a nobody. And well, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you know what? I might as well just remove this verse. What's the point of talking about the devil? He's a nobody. Let me just... Scratch that out. You know what? You don't need to worry about him. You got everything under control. The Holy Spirit's inside of you. Sealed until the day of redemption. Don't worry about it. Peter said, no. That lion, he's worth looking out for. He's worth your attention. And I'm not saying, oh, just constantly think about the devil. But you need to have him uh, in, on your mind going, you know what? He can get me at any moment. And so, so... Christian, what are you looking out for? And praise the Lord that, you know, we have like a security team by the Frank and some of the brothers who, who are looking out for us because you think the devil's like, you know what, San Jose Bible Baptist Church, I'm just going to let them worship the Lord. You know what? They want to go and worship the Lord on Sunday. You know what? Let, let's let them go and worship the Lord. I'll come on Monday. I'll come on Tuesday to try to disrupt something when nobody's here. No, the devil wants to get in at any moment he can. He's a roaring lion. He's waiting out there. He's waiting out there. If you heard a lion was outside the door right now, you'd be like, all right, what are we going to do, guys? What are we going to do? Well, where are we going to go? Well, who are we going to call? How are we going to get rid of this lion? You know, you would be, you would be on your toes, ready to, to try to get something and try to figure out what you're going to do as a church. So why aren't you doing that? And, and, and you think the devil's just going to go, you know what? They, they, they didn't want me there, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. They don't want me there. I'm not going to go. Why don't these Christians, they don't want me. No, he, he's waiting. So, so just be careful. Don't, don't be fooled, Christian. My third point is don't stop carrying your cross. Don't stop carrying your cross. Uh, reading your Bible every day is important, Christian, for you and your brethren. Because how are you going to know that you have an adversary, the devil, who wants to devour you if you don't read the Bible? I mean, if nobody read the Bible, how would you know this, this verse? How would people know the things of the Bible if they don't read it? So you must read. And all I'm doing is reminding myself as well as all of you because I don't want to see anyone devoured. I don't want to see anyone fall into the mouth of the lion to be destroyed but unfortunately, that can happen because the Bible says so. Unfortunately, there will be people who will fall into the devil's mouth and be devoured. But hopefully not you, Christian. Hopefully not you. Another thing that, that can happen um, is, uh, is that you can backslide if you don't read the Bible. And that's why you should read it so that it can prevent you from backsliding. Turn over to Proverbs 14. Proverbs chapter 14. And uh, we'll read verse 14. The Bible says, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Um, 
Do you think that the backslider in heart is fellowshipping with the Lord? Backslider in heart's not fellowshipping with the Lord. It's filled with his own ways, and for you ladies, her own ways, okay? Um, but what's more attractive to you? Is it TV? Is it sports? Is it a social life? You know, uh, uh, the, the, I think the, the NFL playoffs are going on right now. You know, there's some people who go, you know what, I'll go to church when it's the, play, when it's the uh, NFL offseason, Whenever those months are, I'll, I'll go to church during those months. But when football comes on, you know what? Then I stop. Then I stop. Well, what's the point? Why don't you just stop altogether then? I mean, if, you're, if you have that kind of mindset, you got, have that kind of attitude, if you go, you know what? Well, my favorite team is playing, so, oh, I can't go to church. I can't go, I can't go worship God. My favorite team is playing. Or how about this? This is a big one now, right? Politics. Do the things of the political realm uh, interest you more than the word of God and the preaching and the teaching and learning? I mean, listen, yeah, you shouldn't be ignorant of Satan's devices, and that's one of his devices. But are you spending every single hour, every single minute of the day trying to, trying to hear what, what Joseph Biden is doing, what Kamala Harris is doing, what, what Gavin Newsom is doing, what Nancy Pelosi is doing, what Donald Trump is doing, what, what, what whoever your favorite politician is or who, who your favorite person who talks about politics? Because that's a big thing, too, right? Talking about politics. Does that interest you more than the things of God or, or, or is souls growing in grace, growing in charity, learning about God? Does that interest you more? Dr. Ruckman said in his Proverbs commentary, nothing can stop the decay of the soul but constant vigilance. The backslider must find the point of departure, return to it, confess it, make restitution if necessary, amend his ways and start over. Revelation 2, 1 through 4. It is better to be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18, than filled with your own ways. Amen. Um, when I backslide, my fellowship with God is broken. Has anyone ever experienced something different? Is your fellowship with God closer when you backslide? No. No. The times that I've backslid, I have been sad, depressed, bitter towards God because I kept backsliding. God didn't do anything I did, and I was bitter towards Him. I thought, oh, it's too hard, God. How can I keep walking so close to you and not backslide? It's so natural. But being a Christian isn't meant to be easy. Go ahead and turn over to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. There is some effort, some kind of work that you must do if you want to be a Christian. If you call yourself a Christian, but you're not doing this, are you a Christian? I don't know. I don't think so, because that's what Jesus said is what it takes. Me, Christian means follower of Jesus. Right. Being a follower of Christ requires you to do something in your life. Not the life of, of your wife your husband, your kids, your friends, the rest of your family, your co-workers. God's interested in your life. Yes. If you got the entire world to follow Jesus and to do the things of God and you weren't doing any of them, it wouldn't profit you anything. It wouldn't profit you anything because you wouldn't have any fellowship. You wouldn't be any closer to God. Yeah, those people would be. But God wants you. He wants you, Christian. Um, and so you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. And so what must we deny ourselves from? The simple answer is sin. Uh, take a look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 5. Verse 5. 
The Bible reads, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Uh, notice how Paul mentions five things here. Five is the number of death, right? But, but mortify is done through your affection and putting off the old man. It's not some flagellation or mutilation like some people practice and some people think, look, you can flagellate yourself all you want, you can mutilate yourself all you want, but you won't be any closer to God. And you won't have done anything to gotten rid of these things. Um, verse 2, you look at it, it says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So our affection should be above in heaven, right? It's not down here on earth. And the putting off of the old man is verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the, de the, put off the old man with his deeds. That's what you do. You put off the old man. And I'm not saying that, that this is easy or, or this is, will be real simple. But when you start refusing the requests of the flesh, the easier it becomes to keep saying no. You have to start somewhere. You can't just go, it's too hard, so I'm never going to start. I'm never going to refuse the request of the flesh. Once you start, you get the ball rolling, it becomes easier. Amen, brother, that's good. So, so, so start doing that, Christian. Amen. Galatians 5, 22 through 25 shows that we should yield to the Holy Spirit Amen. and the Holy Spirit allow him to subvert the flesh. Uh, Jesus didn't say, you know what, take up some roses. Take up some flowers daily and follow me. That's real simple, right? You know, it's real easy to just go pick some flowers off the ground. You know what, wave it around. You know, have a nice old time. I mean, some people might do that. I don't think they're following Jesus, but uh, I don't know. It's not what the book says. Um, he, didn't, he didn't say, why don't you decide what it is that you want to take up for my name's sake, huh? Why don't you decide what it is that you want to take up to make you a Christian? He didn't ask his disciples, hey, what's your opinion about what I just said? Do you like the fact that I asked you to, to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me? You know what? Let's sit in a circle. I'm going to ask all you disciples and you tell me what you think. And, and you, you tell me if this is too hard for you, if I should water it down. Down, if I should make it easier for you to digest. No, Jesus said, this is what it is. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If you don't like it, well, guess what? Don't be a Christian. It's that simple. Jesus is like, either you do this or you don't. You don't have to, but hey, if you want to, if you're serious, do it. If you don't want to, if you think it's too hard, all right, here's the door. Exit stage left. Exit stage right, wherever. Um, one of the biggest problems today is people thinking that their opinion is more important than what God said and what he tells us to do. This is especially a huge problem in modern Laodicean Christianity. Yeah. The vast majority of churches and Christians today don't put God's holy word above themselves. They don't put his word, like, like Psalm said, thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. The Lord magnified the word above his name, and yet Christians think that the word of God shouldn't be put above them, that the word of God is below them, that they stand on the book, that they correct the book, that they change it and they make it a, a, just a, a nice old little thing that, you know what, doesn't have any power whatsoever, no conviction, no power, no truth. It's just a bunch of garbage. And, and so modern Laodicean Christianity comes to you and asks you what your opinion is of the Bible. Hey, what do you think? Do you like this verse? Uh, you know, they do this in Bible studies. Uh, some of you may have gone to one of them. They sit in a circle, sing Kumbaya, and start asking each other what their opinion is. You know what? Hey, what's your opinion? Hey, devil, what's your opinion? Oh, Isaiah 14, you don't like? Oh, yeah, you know what? We should change it to a, a day star, a morning star. Oh, yeah, it's not you, huh, Lucifer? It wasn't you who fell. Oh, yeah, you know what? Ta change the deity of Christ. Remove the blood. Remove Jesus Christ's name out of verses. Take chapters out. Take verses out. Yeah, that sounds real nice, devil. I really like your opinion. I'm going to implement that into the word of God. 
You see, you see where this is going? You think that your opinion, it, it matters. Your opinion doesn't matter to God. Your opinion doesn't matter about his word. His word is what it is. Take it or leave it. I'm not saying that there are verses that devotionally, spiritually speak to each one of us uh, individually, right? Because there are verses that speak to you personally and, and because based off your experience, based off your background, that's a little bit different. But let's not forget that the Bible says, 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, Amen. thoroughly furnished in all good works. It's doctrine that never changes. Doctrine will never change, and doctrine remains the same forever. You may not like it, but doctrine is the foundation. You may have nice spiritual and, and, and devotional application, and praise the Lord, we all do, but that doctrine is important and is what keeps us growing. It's the foundation upon which we build upon. We don't build upon spiritual and devotional things all the time. We have to build upon the doctrine of the Word of God. Amen. Our opinion about the Word of God doesn't matter. We must submit ourselves to God, just like James chapter 4 says, and submit to how God tells us to live our life. Submit to follow Him and submit to the worship that He desires and tells us to do, even if it's contrary to how we are used to. I mean... You know, all across the world today, there's rock concerts going on. And it's happening inside of churches. It's not happening in the world. It's happening inside of a church, inside of the place of God, the house of God. And modern Christianity tells you, you know what? Just worship him however you like. You know, singing in tongues, you know, whatever, rolling on the ground. If you want to you go up on the roof, go up on the roof. If you want to, you, you know, blow up the building, blow up the building. It doesn't matter. I mean... That's what they say. That's what's happening in modern Christianity. And, and it's unfortunate. It's sad. Even though the book says that, that you must worship him in spirit and in truth. Yeah. So what? your spiritual. If it's not based in truth, it's nothing. It's nothing. He didn't say. So, so here's some good advice. Don't change the book. Let the book change you. He didn't say, follow me and things will be perfect in your life. He didn't say, you will have a healthy, wealthy life with no problems. You will have everything you want. The, the, the uh, husband, the wife of your dreams, the job of your dreams. You know what? Yeah, just give a little money to my ministry and God will bless you. You know, I mean, that's what you hear with Joel Osteen and, and Rick Warren and all these other uh, false teachers and false preachers. Um, he didn't say that, that, you know what, just do what pleases your flesh and, and you know what, everything will be all right. He said if you're serious about being a Christian, right. about following the Lord, then you must do something daily, yeah. which is to take up your cross. And, and uh, do you think that your flesh wants to take up your cross? Your flesh don't like to take up anything. Yeah. I mean, yeah. let's be honest. Yeah. Your flesh don't like to do anything. It wants to backslide away from God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why Jesus said you got to deny yourself yeah. because he knows that that's natural for you to do, to backslide. Deny yourself so that you can take up your cross. The cross that Jesus Christ carried contained the sins of the world. But you know what happens when you pick up your cross? It keeps you away from the sins of the world. It keeps you away from sin and wickedness and filth. Because you got no time going off into the world. Because all you're doing is holding that cross. You're bearing that cross daily. The world, the flesh, and the devil have done a great job at making Christians feel like that cross is a burden. But the moment that you set down that cross is the very moment that you start to backslide. You start to wander. And we've all done it. We've all set down that cross. But in reality... Just like the hymn, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary, all your burdens were lifted. There are no burdens taking up that cross. Everything was lifted at Calvary. Everything, when you got saved, all those burdens went away. So carry that cross. Don't set it down. Because the moment that you do is the moment that you're filled with your own ways, backslidden, praying, wishing, hoping that you could get back to that cross back to that cross that you once held so dear. So don't set it down. 
And the only thing that can make you more like Jesus Christ is to deny yourself and take up your cross. I mean, Jesus, Jesus' cross had the sins of the world. Your cross, I think it's pretty small in comparison to his, right? I think it's, I think it's pretty manageable, right? He didn't say take up your cross and somebody else's. He said just take up yours. That'll be plenty enough. My, my fourth point is don't stop continual cleansing. Don't stop continual cleansing. Um, go back over to John, uh, 1 John 4, or 1 John 1, excuse me. 1 John chapter 1. Uh, some of you are probably thinking, Brother Daniel, your title is which way sheep? But you haven't mentioned sheep at all in your sermon. Uh, hopefully, here's where it makes sense and ties in. There's a number of reasons why sheep wander. One of the reasons is they follow older members of the flock. So if an older, older sheep gets sidetracked, it can lead the entire flock into danger without any hesitation. Wow. Another reason they wander is they need and follow strong leaders. So without a shepherd guiding the sheep, they will easily become lost. I mean, right now, you know, our shepherd is, is, is away for a little bit, and praise the Lord, he's coming back soon, and we're all looking forward to it. And you know what can happen when, it, when a shepherd leaves the flock for too long? The sheep can wander and get scattered because there's no shepherd, right? And so um, praise the Lord that, that we do have a shepherd, and, and uh, you know, also the Lord is our shepherd, right? The last reason I'll mention is that sheep... The sheep's vision is a little weird. Um, unlike you and I, sheep have eyes on the side of their head, so they can't see directly in front of them, which means when they start, when they want to go straight, they have to turn their head left or right in order to walk straight. And what ends up happening is they don't walk in a straight line, kind of like how Christians, right? We don't walk in a straight line because we're off, we're off looking left and right. We're not looking straight at the Lord. We're not looking straight at the shepherd who's trying to lead us and guide us in the direction we're going. We're like, oh, this, this looks real nice. That looks real nice. Sin looks real nice. And, and that's another reason why sheep need a shepherd. Um, in 2015, Chris, an, Austra an Australian sheep, was found after having wandered away from his flock five or six years prior to being found. Because he had, gone, he had been gone for so many years, his wool had, gr had grown so thick to the point where people who found him, they had no idea that he was a sheep. They thought that he was some other, some other creature. They thought they didn't recognize who this was. Wow. They estimated that his wool was five times its normal size and extremely dangerous for Chris, as he could barely see and walk from the heaviness of the wool. If he had fallen over at any point, he would have not been able to get back up and most likely would have been killed by a wolf, fox, or starvation. A sheep shearer was called in to shear all the excess wool that had grown on this lost sheep. He ended up breaking the world's record for having the heaviest fleece. More than 88 pounds of wool was removed from his body. Without all the extra wool, he wages 97 pounds, almost half of what his weight was in his lost state. Uh, I, I would encourage some of you, if, if you have the time, to, to, to search pictures of Chris, this Australian sheep, and see just exactly how big this thing was when it was off in the world and how dirty that wool was. Because one of the coolest things to see was to see Chris in his dirty state and in his clean state. To see Chris, uh, the, the dirty wool removed from his body, to see a fleece that was as white as snow for everyone to see. And praise the Lord, that happens to you at salvation. Praise the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ takes your dirty wool and he removes it from your body. You know who the first one to see the sheep as white as snow was that sheep shear. You know who the first one to see you clean? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the first one to see. The sheep shear took his shear and took that wool away. You know what takes your dirty wool away? The blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanses us from all sin. That blood takes that dirty wool and removes it from your body and says it's no more. It's gone. It's gone. Um, when you came humbly to the Lord and said, I'm nothing but a lost sinner, a lost sheep. 
I need to get my sins cut away. I want to feel clean. The Lord said, not a problem. Not a problem. Come right in. Come right in. I'll make you clean. So just like 1 John 1, 7 says, the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanses us from all sin. All sin. Every day you should ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you and to make you clean. Because the longer you go without doing it, the longer you go without asking the Lord, the more dirty your wool is going to get. The more dirty that, that clean fleece that the Lord made clean, it's going to keep growing and it's going to keep getting bigger. It's going to get dirtier. It's going to get dirtier and it's not going to be good for you. That's when that lion can come in and devour you real easy. So every day, Christian, every day, um, Christ, uh, Chris, he died in 2019, and one of the founders of the sanctuary he lived at said that he's been really happy and healthy. His death came out of the blue. His system just gave way. My friend, one thing about life is that tomorrow is never guaranteed. Tonight is never guaranteed. You never know when the Lord has your date of death. You never know when the things of this world might come and it might be too much and, and you might end up dying. You never know when the rapture is going to happen. You never know when the Lord might return. So many people think that they'll just figure out what happens after life at a later date, when they got time, when they're retired, when they have, you know, uh, when, when a death in the family occurs. But you need to start thinking about what happens after death right now if you're not saved. And if you're not saved, you need to get saved. But death doesn't play nice. It will come out of the blue. You think that you have time to play in sin and play in the world and play in filth and get dirty and, and you'll just come back and get clean in the Lord. Well, guess what? That time, that opportunity may never come up for you. And then you'll be standing at the judgment seat of Christ and you'll be, why didn't I get right with the Lord when I had time? Why didn't I get right with God when I had an opportunity to? Um, you take a shower daily, don't you? So why don't you get clean spiritually daily? Why don't you come to the Lord and ask you to cleanse him of your sins? Will you be wandering off in sin or will you be walking closely to God when he finds you? So, brethren, whatever you need to get right with the Lord, do it today. Don't delay. Maybe you're a lost sheep right now. You've never had your sins washed in the blood. Don't be afraid. Come to Jesus and make today the day of your salvation. Or perhaps you are saved, but you've just been wandering. Maybe you haven't been to church in a while, or you're hesitating to attend a Bible-believing church. Um, some of you have no clue what you should do in your life. And you're, getting, you're, you're, you're looking everywhere in the world trying to find answers, and, and you're looking everywhere in the world that appeals to your flesh. Something that you wanted to get a closer look at, now you've gotten a closer look at, and you realized it's empty. There's nothing there for me. But, but you've been wandering for years now. You've been wandering away from God, from church, from the things of God, his word, from the people of God. So why don't you come and tell the Lord, you know what? That wandering, it's endless. I want to come and get clean. Could you please cleanse me and wash me in the blood of the lamb? Jesus will do it. I want to be clean. I want to get back to the flock. I'm coming back, Lord. I'm done backsliding. I'm done trying to live in the world and do the things of the world. I'm coming back to you. I'm coming back to Bible reading, to prayer, to church attendance, and I'm not leaving. Lord, thank you for being so good to me and giving me a chance to get right. So which way will you go, sheep? Will you go to the Lord to be your shepherd and guide, or will you keep wandering away from the one who created you? and knows everything about you. Every head bow and every eye shut, the altar call is open.